My topic tonight is Revelation Unmasks the Cult Deception. It was a 911 call on a fairly typical Wednesday afternoon in Rancho Santa Fe, California, that tipped off the police. The anonymous car on the other end of the line said, you may want to check out the welfare of the residents at a certain address. When the squad car got there, it was a very upscale neighborhood, a palatial estate on three acres of land overlooking the Pacific Ocean with nine bedrooms. What they found made national headlines and national news. Newsweek said, follow me inside the Heaven's Gate mass suicide. When the police rolled up to that mansion in Rancho Santa Fe that March day of 1997, this is what they found. 39 bodies, all dressed in black, black sweatsuits on, jogging suits, black Nike sneakers. They all had the same buzz cuts, at first, the police thought that they were all men. They discovered later that 21 of them were women. Everyone had a passport, birth certificate, and driver's license on their bodies. They all had a duffel bag placed at the foot of their bed with their personal artifacts in them. And then there was a little note about how the mixture for the vodka and phenobarbital that they took was supposed to be chemically mixed. And on the bottom of the note, it said, drink it all down, relax, and rest. Who were these people of the Heaven's Gate cult? Were they some wild-eyed fanatics? Who were they? There was a teacher respected in her community. There was a postal worker of a number of many years. There was a housewife and mother of five. These were not fanatical people. They, some were young and some were middle-aged and some were old. Most were very highly educated. They supported themselves by their computer businesses on the web page. So these were not some intellectual crackpots. Highly educated, sophisticated, computer literate, they had ample amounts of cash, they had bought this mansion. Why is it that they followed one Marshall Applewhite and his co-leader, why did they follow them? What reason did they do that? Why did they follow them to a mass suicide of death? One thing is for certain, cults are absolutely exploding. Many people, young and old, are tired of churches that have little power. They're tired of churches where they go each weekend, each Sunday, and find spiritual nothingness. They're spiritually hungry. They long for something more. They long for something spiritual. They long for love. And they go into many a churches, and they're so cold you could skate down the center aisle. So these people are looking for love. They're looking for warmth. They're looking for true fellowship, like in the New Testament. They're looking for something that stands for something. So many churches today don't stand for anything. So many churches today are afraid to say anything about drinking because they may lose half their members. They don't want to say anything about tobacco because they lose another half. They don't want to say anything about premarital sex. They'll lose too many young people. They don't want to say anything about extramarital affairs. They'll say some lose other people. So, so many churches today have watered down the gospel message that many honest-hearted people stop going. And they say, look, why should I go to church? I'm no better off that I, if I go or not. And so they don't find love. They don't find warmth. They don't find a Bible foundation. And so they begin searching. They begin looking, and unfortunately, many of them are looking in all the wrong places. In, the, in a two-year period, there was a 73% increase in New Age books. 
The new age is exploding. Go to any bookstore today, and you'll see whole sections on the new age. People are turning from the God of the Bible to the God within themselves, the so-called God within themselves. People today are looking for some magic incantation. They're wearing crystals around their neck. They're burning incense. They're looking for love and warmth, looking for some age of Aquarius. They're looking for a personal channeler that can channel them to an astral plane outside their bodies. They're trying to have some supernatural experience where the soul leaves the body and goes into spiritual ecstasy. And many people are going down a dead-end road and ending up in cults. Forbes magazine put it this way, astounding figures. Forbes magazine reported close to $2 billion per year being spent on changes to spiritual and physical well-being. $2 billion spent on spiritual aids. Spirituality is exploding in our society. Men and women recognize that they just can't face the stresses of 20th century society and 21st century society alone. So they're looking, they're searching, and unfortunately, they are running directly into cults. Unfortunately, the areas that they're running to are often very, very deceptive. Often, the areas that they're running to are like these. There are between 3,000 and 5,000 new religious movements in the United States. Three to 5,000 new religious movements. Many of them are cults. New religious movements are springing up like mushrooms in the south on a spring day after a rain. You know, it used to be easy to identify who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. I'll date myself. Have any of you watched long ago The Long Ranger? or Hopalong Cassidy, or Roy Rogers. Oh, yeah, I knew that I had a section here that was familiar. Now, now some of you are a little younger, you know. You don't know about the Long Ranger and Hyo Silver. You know, ask your grandma. She'll tell you about it. You know, granny will tell you that one. Now, in those old cowboy movies, how did you tell the good guys from the bad guys? You got it. You got it. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Bad guys always wear the black hats. The good guys always wore the white hats. You watch those old... Long Ranger movies, Hyo Silver, you know, you watch Roy Rogers, you ro watch Hopalong Cassidy, those old cowboy ones, and the bad guys come riding up with their black hats on, and immediately you know, that guy's a bad guy, right? See the guys come riding up in the white hat hats, and that guy's the good guy. Wouldn't it be so easy if all false religious leaders just wore black hat and all the good guys wore white hat and say, ah, that's it, <laughs> he's a bad guy, ah, there's a good guy, you know? That would make it so much easier, wouldn't it? But it's not so simple today. Because sometimes you get confused with the bad guys and the good guys and you're not quite sure who they are. But the Bible distinguishes between the genuine and the counterfeit. And I'm gonna give you five ways tonight you can tell a cult from a genuine religious church, a genuine biblically-based church. I'm going to give you five ways in the Bible. Five ways you can distinguish between the true and false. Five ways you can distinguish between the genuine and the counterfeit. Now, the people that I'm concerned about most are the people who say, I will never get deceived. Those are the people I worry about the most. The people who say, look, I need this information because I know that there are going to be great deceptions in the future. Those are the people that are not going to be deceived. But the people that have a ho-hum attitude, oh my, you know, those poor other people, they're all going to be deceived. You know, it's the other people that are going to be deceived, you know. Reminds me of a story I heard once of how they sort oranges down in Florida. You know, they sort the oranges, A oranges, B oranges, and C oranges. So they go out and take all the oranges off the orange trees, put them in a great big dump truck. Take the truck into a warehouse and put all these oranges on a conveyor belt. And all these oranges are on a conveyor belt, and they're going along. Now, imagine that oranges could talk, and one orange begins speaking to the other. And the one orange says, ha ha, this is fun. I'd rather be out on this conveyor belt than on that hot Florida sun. This is so much fun. And all the oranges are bouncing along. They come to a series of holes. The holes are small enough to let the grade C oranges through, but they are too small 
to allow the grade B oranges through. So the grade C oranges can fall through those holes just big enough for them. So all these oranges are on the conveyor belt and they're going along and they're having a great time and the C's and the B's and the A's are all talking. This is fantastic. This is like Orange Disneyland. Then they go up to the C holes and all the C oranges fall through. Boom, boom, boom. And pretty soon they're going to be orange juice. The A's and B's go along. They say, that was too bad. Those C's went through. They're going to be orange juice. They go around another corner and there are holes big enough for the B's to go through, but not big enough, but too small for the A's to go through. So they sort the B oranges. Boom, boom, boom. They go and all the A's are so proud, you know. Hey, those B's are going to be orange juice. We're going to the end on the roller coaster of Orange Disneyland. But they come around the corner and there are holes big enough for the A's to go through. And they are going to be orange juice too. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm concerned about people who say, I'm on this ride all the way to the end, and I'm never going to fall. That's just like Peter, who, th who said, Lord, though all men forsake you, not me, Lord. I mean, I'm committed. I've gone through the end. And the Lord looked at him, he said, before the rooster cries three times, you'll deny me three times. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if, you, if we are not clear in our mind how to identify a cult, right tonight, there can be a certain mind conditioning that's going on in your mind that you don't even know. And that mind conditioning is going on and you don't even know it. And you might be in a Christian church, but the devil is so smart and he is so subtle and he's so ingenious that he's working in your mind in ways you don't even know. And he's preparing you to accept the mark of the beast. He's preparing you to accept the Antichrist. And you're not even aware of what's going on because he's so subtle. Tonight, I'd like to share with you how you can be aware of what's going on, how you can identify a cult, and how you can be sure your mind never gets caught in a cult trap. Because before you ever go out and follow the beast power at the time of the end, your mind has gone down that direction, so it's easy for your feet to follow in years from now where your mind has already been going now. Are you with me? If your mind goes that direction, soon your feet are going to go that direction. So how do you identify a cult? In what way do you identify a cult? First, cults have a single powerful leader who becomes the cult's messiah. In every instance, every cult has a single powerful leader who becomes the cult's messiah. Beware of surrendering your mind to any pastor, any rabbi, or any priest. I have people say to me, oh, I love my pastor so much, I could never make any change because I've been going to this church for so many years, and oh, pastor, I love my pastor. I could, I, well, I know that some of the things he, doesn't, he teaches are not quite from the Bible, but I love him, so, you know, and, and I, are you elevating him above Jesus? If you say, I will do whatever my pastor says, even if it's not in harmony with the Bible, you are elevating him, whether you realize it or not, above Jesus. Every cult. See, and the way you ultimately become a part of a cult is now something happens in your mind where anything in your life, some religious authority, becomes your Messiah. That's exactly what happened with the Marshall Applewhite case. It was an expanded issue here, expanded degree. Applewhite said this. He said, Bonnie... Kittles and I, who was his co-leader, are on an evolutionary level above the human, the kingdom of heaven, incarnated in two human bodies. Do you see what he was saying? He was saying, look, I, I came down from heaven, and I'm incarnated in a human body, is, and so is Miss Nittles, my uh, compatriot. We're not really human. We're divine. See, that was a very obvious deception. In fact, in September of 1995, Applewhite referred to himself as a messenger from God, just like Jesus was. So all cults have a powerful leader who becomes that cult's messiah. Take Luc Jarre of the Solar Temple. He had members in France, Switzerland, and Canada. He also believed that he was an incarnation of Christ. So any religious leader that becomes a substitute Christ any religious leader that takes the place of Christ is a false Christ. In fact, the Bible put it this way, Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation chapter 17. Both harmonize. We'll look at Revelation 17 first, then Matthew 24. 
Revelation 17, verse 13 says, These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Notice, men and women who give their power and authority and their mind to their religious leader. I don't want to have to do any religious thinking. If my pastor says it, he is a godly man, and it, would, it must be so. Once you give your mind to a religious authority, and you don't do thinking or studying for yourself in religious matters, and you accept what a pastor or priest says, you are on your way to receiving the mark of the beast and accepting the great cult, because it says these are of what? Revelation 17, 13. One mind, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So no one has authority to make religious decisions for you. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24 says, for, read it with me please, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders and to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Who are the elect? The elect are Christians. The elect are believers. But they'll be false Christs. They are substitute Christs. False Christs and false prophets will arise. They will teach error. But people whose minds have been used to accepting what a popular pastor said. They have been used to accepting what a popular figure said, a popular religious figure. So as the result of that, their minds are conditioned that if a powerful religious figure says it, and if all these people believe it, how could it be wrong? I've had so many people say to me so many times, I begin to preach truth in these lectures and preach the Bible Sabbath and preach the truth about the second coming of Christ, and people come up to me and they say, oh, but pastor, how can so many people be wrong? The majority must be right. Well, in Noah's day, the majority wasn't right. They were destroyed in the flood, right? In the days of Jesus, the majority nailed him to the cross. And it was the religious leaders that stirred up the secular government, the Romans. It was the Pharisees. And people followed their religious leaders in the days of the first coming of Christ. And they nailed Jesus to the cross. So merely because one is a popular religious leader, he is not your Messiah. And ladies and gentlemen, he is not your Christ. There is only one Christ. He is the one we owe our allegiance to, no earthly religious leader, because false Christ will deceive the very elect. Notice what the Bible says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. Now let's pause there for a moment. That day will not come. What day is that day that will not come? The second coming of Christ. Back to the text. Don't be deceived by any means. That day, the second coming of Christ, will not come unless the falling away comes when? First. Now notice the next phrase. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So it says the second coming of Christ will not come until the man of sin, the Antichrist, the beast power, is revealed first. Some Christians think that the rapture takes place, then the man of sin is revealed. But the Bible says, don't let anybody deceive you, for that day the second coming of Christ will not come until the man of sin is revealed first. Then it says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God, this is the Antichrist, the beast power, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The ultimate deception is when the Antichrist appears with religious clothing as a popular religious leader, and as I will show from the Bible tonight, he pretends he can heal the sick, People apparently are leaping out of wheelchairs. They're throwing crutches away. They're claiming to be healed of cancer. Thousands and thousands come. And he claims that he has authority and ultimately the authority to change God's very law. Ladies and gentlemen, to follow the cult in the end time is to be in your mind now manipulated by Satan. Satan knows that the average Christian is not going to go follow some cult leader. 
So what Satan does is he conditions us today to accept religious authorities in our life as the last word. And we say, well, if everybody's following this religious authority, how could all these preachers be wrong? How could all these priest groups be wrong? I know the Bible doesn't quite say that, but if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the mind conditioning process that Satan wants exactly so that men and women will follow the false Christ rather than the true Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, it says this, Little children, it is the, what time is it, ladies and gentlemen? It is what time? The last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist, next two words, is coming. So the Antichrist is coming. Now, 1 John says something is coming and something has come. The Antichrist is coming, but the text goes on. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. So the Antichrist is coming, but many Antichrists have come. What does that mean? The word anti does not mean against. Many people think the word Antichrist means something or someone that is against Christ. For three years, I studied the Latin language, and Antichrist doesn't mean against, it means another. So it's the Antichrist is not somebody against Christ. He is somebody who pretends to be Christ, is another Christ, takes the place of Christ. And so the Antichrist in the beast power will come in the future in religious clothing, disguised, pretending he is Christ. But many Antichrists are in the world today. That is, before the Antichrist, many Antichrists are in the world, many claiming that they have the power of God, that they are a reincarnation of Christ. You had that in Jim Jones with the People's Temple, leading 913 people to take Kool-Aid-laced suicide in the jungles of Guyana. He said, I see Christ in me. You had that in Luc Jarret in the Solar Temple. People burned themselves to death in France, Switzerland, and Canada, all within a matter of weeks. He said, I am God incarnate. You had that in Marshall Applewhite down there at Rancho Santa Fe, California. He said, there is God in me. You had that, indeed, with David Koresh when he said, I am the I am in Waco, Texas. As you look at these predictions in the Bible, many antichrists, and today, although many a pastor would never, never admit it, he comes across to his congregation as if his word is law, as if he is the Messiah. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no substitutes. There are only counterfeits. No substitutes. There is only one Jesus. And my Bible says, Acts the fourth chapter, the twelfth verse, read it with me please, Acts 4 verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven. There is only one Jesus born in the womb of Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. There is only one Jesus born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. There is only one. Touch the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped. There is only one Christ. He touched the withers with the arm of the withered, on that withered arm. And it was healed and instantly. He touched the tongue of the dumb and they sang. Touched the eyes and the ears of men and women and all their full senses came to life. They could see flowers and trees. They could see sunshine again. When he touched the lame, they leaped and sang praises to him. There is only one Christ. He is the one that wrote in the sands of Jerusalem. Go, your sins are forgiven. I don't condemn you. There is one who can forgive sin. There is one that can deliver men and women from demons. There is one who can take a prostitute and make her pure, who can take a thief and make him honest, that can take a greedy, selfish man and make him unselfish and kind that can take an angry man and make him calm. There is one Christ. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved except Jesus. There is one that walked Golgotha's hill. There is one that climbed Calvary's mountain. 
There is one that stretched out his hands on wooden bars and had spikes driven through them. There is one that was suspended between heaven and earth for our sins. There is one that wore the crown of thorns. There is one that wore that bloody crown with blood running down his face and had spikes driven through his hands and a spear driven through his side. There is one whose broken, bloody, battered, bruised body was taken off the cross and laid in a newly, newly hewn tomb. It was Friday, dark, dark Friday. The flowers drooped their heads on Friday. The birds stopped singing on Friday. The thunder rolled, the lightning flashed on Friday. There is one that bowed his head, his bloody head, and died in the rain on Friday. Judas betrayed him on Friday. Peter denied him on Friday. The disciples forsook him on Friday. The Romans crucified him on Friday. There is one that died on Friday. And hallelujah. They laid him in the tomb. And Sunday morning, the angel of God descended. And all the Roman soldiers could not keep the Son of God in the tomb. And the brightness of the glory of the angel caused those Roman soldiers to fall over like dead men. And the stone was rolled away, and the angelic voice said, Son, arise, your father calleth you. And Christ came forth out of that tomb, resurrected from the dead. There is only one Jesus that is worthy of your worship, that is worthy of your praise. Cults have a human Messiah that substitutes for Christ, and I am here to tell you tonight that there is only one fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, still load all their guilty stains. We sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. There is one Christ. Do not accept any other, any other. For in him there is forgiveness, in him there is mercy. No matter what your church teaches, and no matter what your pastor teaches, no matter how good a preacher he is, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you tonight that the only safety is not making a commitment to your pastor or your priest or your church. The only safety is to make a commitment to that living Christ and let him lead you. First sign of a cult is a powerful world leader, powerful Messiah who substitutes for Christ. Second identifying mark of a cult. The cult takes the leader's word rather than the Bible. What the cult leader says is the absolute truth. Don't question it, just follow it. Don't use your brain, don't think, and that absolute truth overshadows the Bible. That truth of that leader takes the place of the Bible. Revelation puts it this way, Revelation 18, verse 23, by your sorcery, that is your trickery, that is human opinion, all the nations were deceived. So Satan deceives people who are looking for truth, and they follow a human leader whose word takes the place of truth. My Bible says, Jesus put it this way, John 17, verse 17, read it with me, please. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What is truth? Is truth a matter of my opinion or your opinion? No, the Bible says your word, God's word, is truth. Now, there are many religious leaders, there are cult leaders, that lead people from God's word. And they're so powerful that people follow them. I think of one from Garland, Texas, a cult leader by the name of Han Ming Chen. Han Ming Chen was a powerful speaker. And Han Ming Chen said that he was going to be incarnated. In fact, this is what he said. He told his 140 followers that God was going to reincarnate his body, take it to heaven, on March 31, 1998. Now, all the time, his followers had in the Bible, Revelation 1-7, Christ comes with clouds and every eye will see him. Han Ming Chen taught that when Christ would come, only the followers of God would be secretly caught up. He taught that that was kind of a secret coming. It would occur March 31, 1998. All the time, his followers had what was in the Bible. Now, to this man's credit, when that did not happen, he said, I tell my followers, you better go follow somebody else because I was wrong on that one. Find somebody that teaches the Bible. That was 
kind of interesting. You see, cult leaders generally deceive people by supplanting the Bible and teaching their own word. Marshall Applewhite taught that the Hale-Bopp comet would usher in the end, and that right after the Hale-Bopp comet, there was a large flying saucer spaceship that would take their 39 bodies to an astral plane in heaven. You see, any time you turn your back on the Bible, you're liable to deception. The Bible is very plain. Je the Bible says that when Christ comes, we don't need to be deceived. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. It is so plain, you just read it. The Lord himself, I'm quoting 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So my Bible says when Christ comes, the living are changed instantly. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. This mortal ship must put on immortality through 54. This corruptible must put on incorruption. So when Christ comes, the living receive glorious immortal bodies if they're righteous believers. The dead righteous believers are resurrected. John 5, verse 28 says, Marvel not at this. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So there is a resurrection of life when Christ comes. Believers are caught up. But the Bible says, the wicked, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7, are consumed with the brightness of his coming, with everlasting destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 2, 8. So there is no question about what happens in the Bible when Jesus comes. It's clear. But to listen to the teachings of man and get all this confusion going, people are deceived looking at some human teachings. Anytime you let a human being use his word to replace what the Bible says, you are leaning, leaning ever so closely to being deceived by the Antichrist. John chapter 8, verse 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I have so many people that say to me, But pastor, you know, you talked about the Bible Sabbath, and it was so clear in the Bible, and we saw how the Sabbath was changed by man and not by God. But pastor, all these churches, you know, they couldn't be wrong, and my pastor is such a good person. That's not the issue. The issue wasn't, isn't whether your pastor is saved or lost. The issue isn't whether your pastor is a good person preaching the Bible. The issue is very simple. God said to keep the Sabbath. Are you going to do it or not? You know, that's the very issue. You see, that's what God's Word says. We can't judge others. We can't condemn others. But I'll tell you something. The more your mind is conditioned to not to do what the Bible says because it's difficult, or not to do what the Bible says because a religious leader doesn't do it, or not to do what the Bible says because a church doesn't do it. The mind that goes down that way is opening itself up to the master deception by the beast power in the future. Why? Because if I fail to walk in truth today that is so plain and clear and go down a path of compromise, when it becomes increasingly difficult and the pressure is put on me, it'll be easy to go down that path then. So, if any religious leader distorts the gospel and doesn't preach Christ and Christ crucified, you know that's a false religious leader. If any religious leader distorts biblical principles, however much you respect him, you know that that's a distortion and don't follow that teaching. If any religious leader makes up their own rules and superimposes their rules that are not in the Bible, be aware, because that can lead you to deception. Principle number one of a cult, they substitute a human leader for Christ. Principle number two of a cult, they substitute the teachings of that leader for the Word of God. Principle number three of a cult, cults manipulate. They coerce members into submission. Now, cults will use force. They use coercion. Now, the biggest cult power ever to hit this world is called the beast power in Revelation chapter 13. That beast power is yet coming, and we will have an entire lecture on the beast, the mysterious mark, 666. We're going to talk about that. But I want you to see the principles of this beast power. 
in Revelation, as it describes the beast, Revelation chapter 13 puts it this way, verse 16. He causes all, both small and great. Now notice he causes, he coerces, he forces all, both small and great. That's everybody, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Now, what does it mean to receive the mark on your right hand or on your forehead? Many Christians say, oh, that's a tattoo. You get a tattoo on your right hand or your forehead. Too simplistic. Much deeper issues. Revelation is talking about a conflict between good and evil. Revelation is talking about a conflict between Christ and Satan. Satan gives his mark on the right hand or in the forehead. God's mark, his seal, is only found in the forehead. Why? What's the difference? It's this. The hand is always a symbol of pressure. The hand is always a symbol of coercion. The hand is always a symbol of oppression. So Satan says, if you don't do this, I'm going to force you to do it. I'm going to put you in prison. I'm going to keep you from buying or selling. You won't be able to eat any food. So Satan says, I'm going to force you. The people who received the mark in the hand are the people who yielded to that pressure. They didn't stand up. They didn't have the moral courage. They wouldn't stand up to imprisonment or beatings or sufferings or death for Christ. They compromised. They sold out cheaply. Look, I want to say this to young people. Listen. today. If today you are going along as a Christian with the popular way, and you're just floating along, and you say, well, I can't be different from my friends. What are you going to do when the whole world follows the beast? If you say, I can't be different from anybody in my family. I, I, I have to just kind of go along with the flow, you know, go with the flow. Well, God tells you to swim against the current, not to go with the flow. God tells you to stand up and be counted like Daniel, who purposed in his heart to serve God. Like Joseph, who said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? God is looking for men and women today that are loyal, that are faithful, that are committed, that won't yield today, and through the power of Christ they resist. So, they will not yield to the beast. They won't receive his mark in the right hand. What's the mark in the right hand? It is when you yield to pressure. What's the mark in the forehead? Satan's cunning. He says, if you don't yield to pressure, I'll bring all the intellectual arguments against you. What difference does it make? Why not do that? Just it's a little matter. You see, Satan tries to intellectually convince people, or he tries to force people. He doesn't care which way. He gets us. God only, ap only appeals to our logic. God lovingly appeals to our hearts and our minds. God lovingly charms us and wins us. The beast uses force. The beast uses deception. God doesn't use that. God uses only the weapons of love and integrity and honesty and truth. The Bible says you receive the mark in your right hand or in their foreheads, pressure or the intellectual convincing that no man might buy or sell. That's pressure, except one who has the mark or the name of the beast. You see, ladies and gentlemen, cults will try to use force. Cults will try to pressure people. Cults will use a variety of tactics. But Jesus Christ appeals to us. And he says, don't let your mind go down that direction. I am the shaper of the universe, and I can take care of you. If I can create worlds, God says, I promise you, if you step out to follow me, I'll never leave you or I'll never forsake you. God says, if you step out to follow me and you leave a certain friend structure, God says, I'll bring other friends into your life. God says, if you have to lose a job to follow me, I created the whole universe and I created the cattle on 10,000 hills and the silver is gold is mine. And God says, I know how to take care of my own. Don't worry about it. God says, when you step out to follow me and you step out to be different, God says, I know how to take care of your career. I know how to take care of your livelihood. I know how to take care of your name, your reputation. God says, there is only one Christ. Don't accept a cult that has a, sep a counterfeit Messiah. God says there's only one word, the Bible. That's the foundation of faith. Don't accept human teachings. God says, don't go with the flow. Don't compromise. Don't go with the masses. Christians 
who are more comfortable in going with their church than what the Bible says or preparing their minds to be deceived. Christians who are more comfortable with their traditions than they are with Jesus Christ and his word are preparing their minds to be deceived. God is calling us today to make a decision for him. God is calling us to put Christ first in our lives. He's calling us to put the Bible first in our lives. Satan sometimes masquerades. He sometimes wears costumes. You know, I have a sister who, like some people, has a phobia of costumes. You know, some people, if they see anybody in a costume, they start shaking. Well, one of my sisters tells the story that she was speaking. She's an author and a speaker. And she was speaking, and somebody came to promote a particular book, and they were wearing a Chippendale costume, you know, the chipmunk costumes and so forth. And she looked over at them. And, you know, the people that have this phobia of folk in costumes, the reason they do that is they don't know who's in the costume. And she began shaking, you know, her knees began knocking. Some people have that phobia. When Satan comes wearing his costume, we better be afraid, because the Bible says, look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. When Satan comes, he'll come in the last days as a being of dazzling brightness. Satan will come manifesting himself through the Antichrist, through a false religious power. And as Satan does that, manifests himself, he will pretend to be the Christ. What if thousands gathered? What if people apparent were being healed? What if this Christ so-called was so charming? But what if what he was teaching wasn't in harmony with the Bible and he was deceiving people? But you say, cults could never work miracles, could they? I mean, did Jim Jones and these guys, were they actually miracle workers? And Satan can't work miracles, only God can. That's one of the deceptions some Christians have. Look, cults regularly appeal to miracles as a sign of their divine credentials. Proof? Look at the Bible. Revelation chapter 13, verse 13, speaking about the great Antichrist. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men. So the Antichrist says, look at the signs I'm performing. You want to see if I'm of God or not? Look at the signs. In every generation, men and women have asked for signs. In the days of Christ, the Pharisees and scribes said to Jesus, if you are divine, work a miracle. Truth is never confirmed by miracles. Now, does God work miracles? Yes. Can God work miracles? Yes. Will God work miracles? Certainly. But are there false counterfeit miracles? You do not judge truth by miracles. You judge miracles by truth. You don't judge truth by miracles. You don't say, look at all those miracles. I'm awe-stricken. Uh, this razzle-dazzle just knocks me off my feet. Never. Look what the Bible says. Revelation 13, verse 14. And he, the Antichrist, deceives. He does what, everybody? deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, the King James Version, this is the new King James, the King James Version says, by those miracles that he had power to do, was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword and lived. We'll study the whole thing later, but notice this point. Cults work false miracles. The Antichrist will work miracles in the last days, and those miracles, he'll say, are a divine sign that he is blessed of God and he is the religious power that all should worship. Then the Antichrist will say, make an image to the beast. So the Bible says that miracles alone are not a sign of divine truth. Jim Jones, People's Temple, I've listened to tapes of his actual preaching services and watched video of that service in 1978. He would have people, Jim Jones would have people in those services. They'd come up with wheelchairs. He would get up in the service and say, there's somebody over there in the back row, you get a problem with a kidney, you're healed. Now, I feel the healing power coming through me. Then he would say, oh, there's somebody over here on the right, you have a heart problem, I feel the 
Your heart's being healed now. Is there anybody over there? And somebody would get up. They'd come forward. People would come in wheelchairs. They'd be jumping up, praising the Lord. His church was packed, absolutely packed. He was a mainline Baptist preacher. Jim Jones was a mainline preacher for many, many years. Mainline denomination. His church then went independent. But look, friend. These were false miracles that led 913 people to commit suicide in the jungles of Guyana. Because whoever a person is, miracles do not substitute for the Bible. They don't substitute for Christ. They don't substitute for truth. I have some people come to my meetings, they say, look, we're not coming back because we want more razzle-dazzle. We want to go to some big auditorium where people are getting healed. Sure, this little Bible teaching, in one night, out the next night, razzle-dazzle. I'm not here to offer you razzle and dazzle, ladies and gentlemen. I am not here to offer you something superficial. I am here to offer you the Jesus Christ of the Bible. I'm here with thinking people that want to know what the Bible teaches in the last days of Earth's history. You want something solid. You don't want something that tickles your fancy, that's here today and gone tomorrow? You don't want something that wiggles your toes or wiggles your ears or gets you all emotionally hyped, but then it's gone like some soap bubble that bursts? You want something that's solid. You want the Word of God. You want something that's going to last. If you want something solid from the Bible that's going to last, would you say amen for me tonight, ladies and gentlemen? That's what you want. I know that's the kind of audience that you are. But you see, Jim Jones deceived through miracles. False miracles today. Now, don't misunderstand me. God can work miracles. God does work miracles of healing. But never as a substitute for truth. Never as a substitute for God's word. The Bible tells us that the battle of Armageddon will take place through miracles. Look. Revelation 16, verse 14. For they are the spirits of what? demons performing signs, another word is miracles, which go out to the kings of the earth. What happens? Last days of earth's history, economic boycott. Last days of earth's history, financial problems, financial crisis. Last days of earth's history, natural disasters, earthquakes, famines, floods, conflict. Last days of earth's history, a false Christ arises. He's the beast. World leaders don't know what to do. They're confused. He says the whole world has to get back to God, but my way, following my laws, begins to perform miracles. People are being healed. Notice, they're the spirits of demons performing signs and miracles. They go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So the reason the battle of the great day of God Almighty comes, the reason Christians will be persecuted in the last days, is because the false Christ works false miracles to unite church and state to lead them in that direction. Do you see, once you understand what I am talking about tonight, from the Bible, you begin to see what's going on in the mind. Satan has to get you in the mind before he gets you to act. Do you think that multitudes of people are just going to go after the beast? Not on your life. But if Satan gets you to place your pastor or your priest just so subtly ahead of Jesus, if Satan gets you to accept tradition rather than the Word of God, if Satan gets you ever so subtly to conform to the crowd, to look to people for their popular opinion before you move religiously. If Satan gets you ever so subtly to accept miracles and want the razzle-dazzle spectacular instead of truth, then he can palm off an antichrist that is your ultimate preacher, that is your ultimate he can palm off this Antichrist that teaches subtle deceptions. This Antichrist can work miracles, and you'll be wowed off your feet. But if you are solid to follow the true Christ, if in your life you only want to follow God's word, if in your life you will not compromise that if God's word doesn't say it, you don't do it, if in your life, yes, you believe in miracles and that God could work them, but you want truth, not some razzle, Dazzle? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there will be a battle coming called Armageddon. But God will have a people that stand alone, that stand for Christ, that are filled with courage and faith. Fifth point regarding cults tonight. Cults isolate converts from their families. 
How do you identify a cult? This is what a cult does. Now the question is, why does a cult isolate members from their families? This is why. A cult wants to control the mind. Cult leaders don't want questions. Cult leaders don't want people to think. Cult leaders want everybody to march in lockstep. You see, that's what they want. Cult leaders want large groups to be melded into one. The cults don't want individuality. They don't want diversity. They want sameness. That's where cults are going, because they don't want freedom of choice. But the Bible says in the book of Revelation, last verses, Revelation 22, verse 17, and the spirit and the bride, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the bride's a symbol of the church, say come. Let him who hears say come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Notice the Bible says, whoever desires, whoever will, whoever chooses, this is Jesus speaking to you. Jesus knows no coercion. Jesus knows no pressure. Jesus knows no force. Jesus knows no isolating tactics to get one person alone, brainwash them, then get them to mass conformity. The Jesus we serve, this living Christ of the Word, says, Come unto me. Whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Jesus says, You have freedom of choice. The highest essence of what it means to be created in the image of God is the mind that Christ gave to us. And Jesus says, you come with your mind. You come personally and worship me. Don't let a religious leader make your religious decisions. Don't let a priest or a rabbi or minister make your decisions for you. Jesus says, I want thinkers, people that come to me, people that give their hearts to me. Whereas cults want mass conformity, people looking and doing the same. That's what Matt Marshall Applewhite wanted. That is what David Koresh wanted in his cult compound in Waco. They isolate. Cult members must live together. That's what Jim Jones wanted in Guyana. But the God of creation is an amazing God of diversity. He's a God that created people different, created all nature different. You look at nature. There's amazing diversity in nature. There's all kind of flowers. There's lilacs and daffodils and tulips. There's apples and pears and grapefruits. I mean, you look at the animal kingdom. There's 10,000 kind of birds and millions of kind of bugs and insects. God loves variety. The cults don't want any variety, you see. God loves variety. You just look at all the people God created. He created the black and the white and the Asians and the Hispanics. God loves variety. Oh, I reject totally the idea that there are some superior races and there are some inferior races. I don't accept that at all. I believe that we are created of one blood of all nations in Jesus Christ. I believe that we are one common humanity, one common humanity, and that God celebrates our diversity. When I have our, we have our meetings, we have them all over the world. Africa, Asia, South America. People say to me, what's different when you go to preach in Africa? People are the same all over the world. You preach Jesus Christ and the Bible, and people respond. They respond by the thousands in Africa. They respond in South America. They respond in North America. God loves diversity. God wants people that are different. He wants us to worship him with, through the diversity of our own hearts, and we come to Christ. The Bible puts it this way. 1 John 1, chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit that is every religious teacher. Don't believe that the Holy Spirit is in every religious teacher, but test the spirits whether they are of God. And the Bible goes on to say, because many false prophets have gone into the world, God says, you test personally. You are responsible for your own salvation. God says, I've created you with a mind. Don't be molded. Don't let somebody shape your mind. Just because you've gone to a church for 40 years and your mother went to that church and your grandfather went to it and your grandmother went to it, your great-grandfather went to it, God says, test it. If you learn new truth, God says, follow on, move on. You know, God says, keep moving in your spiritual life. God says, through the own mind that you have, 
follow Christ. Look, God loves it when we come to him and ask questions. Because, ladies and gentlemen, here's what the truth in the final analysis. You find it in Romans, the 14th chapter, the 12th verse. The Bible says, read it with me, please. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Your preacher is not going to stand before the judgment bar of God for you, is he? Your wife is not going to stand before the judgment bar of God for you. Your husband's not going to stand before the judgment bar of God for you. Your friends are not going to stand before the judgment bar of God for you. Ladies and gentlemen, cults substitute a human leader for Christ. Cults substitute human tradition for God's word. Cults want to have people isolated, mass conformity. They don't want them to think for themselves. Cults try to stir people up with emotional miracles. But the Bible says, Romans 14, verse 12, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. I am responsible for my salvation before God. Do not fall for the deception. Oh, if my pastor teaches it, it's good enough. Before the judgment bar of God, God says to you, now, may I ask you why you did such and such? And you say, oh, my pastor, he taught it. Is that good enough? Oh, my, my, my husband, he, 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 my aunt, my great, great, great grandfather. I've been a member of that church for years. You know, Jesus came, and the people were stirred. They wanted to follow Jesus. And do you know what happened? Many religious leaders said, but wait a minute. We have been part of the Jewish heritage for years. We could never change now. And when Christ was going to be nailed to the cross, some people wanted to accept him. And the Bible says, many would not believe because of the religious leaders. They said, look, if it's good enough for my grandfather, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for the religious leaders, it's good enough for me. Ladies and gentlemen, if it's good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. If it, is, if it is in the Bible, it's good enough for me because God has given me a mind to think and to reason and make decisions. Here's how you can know if you're vulnerable to a cult. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you look to any human authority rather than Jesus Christ. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you accept the teachings of tradition rather than the Word of God. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you are awed by spectacular miracles, and that's what you want as the basis of your religion. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you fail to live by your own personal convictions. It was Christ, the one with the nails through his hands, that said, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Do you have some burden? some burden that you are carrying, some burden of guilt. Tonight I present to you Jesus Christ. His hands are outstretched for you. Do you need to be forgiven tonight? Tonight I present to you the one whose hands were nailed to the cross for you, Jesus Christ. Tonight, is there some habit that's gripping you and you need to be free? You need to soar like a bird. You need those ropes that are tying you to be cut. You need that jail that's imprisoning you on that secret sin, that door to be opened. Tonight, Christ reaches out his hands to you. He is the one that will forgive you. He is the one that will change you. He is the one that will give you new power. Come unto me, all you that are burdened, he says. Are you burdened about truth? Have you been hearing truth in these meetings, and are you burdened? I do not ask you to follow Mark Finlay. I ask you to follow Jesus Christ. Are you burdened about truth tonight, ladies and gentlemen? Are you burdened about truth? You've been stirred in your soul. You are a truth seeker. Come to Jesus. Open your heart to Jesus. Tell Jesus, Lord, I want to follow you. Tonight, I don't present to you the popular way. I don't present to you the way of, of, of mass conformity. Tonight, I present you the way of Daniel standing alone for Christ. I present to you the way of Joseph, standing alone for Christ. I present to you the way of Jeremiah, standing alone for Christ. I present to you the way of the apostles, who had the courage to face the Roman sword and the Roman Colosseum, standing alone for Christ. 
because that Christ is worth standing alone for. That Christ is worth coming to. That Christ is worth giving your life to. That Christ's invitation is still for you and for me. I remember when I was 17 years old, I was looking for truth. I was going the popular way, doing the party life of my teenage friends, going the way that everybody else was going, party after party. Then I heard the call of God. You know, the problem with the party life is this. No party is ever good enough. You go to one, you've got to go to one greater. And you keep drinking it in. You're never fully satisfied. There's something always missing, something in the pit of your stomach, something way down in your heart. And as a 17-year-old kid, I was wise enough to know that. There was something missing. And I began looking. And I met this Jesus in the Bible, this Christ that forgave my sins, this Christ that changed my life. And there were so many new things that were just exploding in my life. My dad invited me to a series of meetings with him, just like this that you're attending to. And I walked in, and they were singing a song. And the song went like this, Open mine eyes that I can see. Glimpses of truth illumine me. Open mine ears that I can hear. And I said, Lord, do it for me. Do it for me. Lord, open my eyes. I really want to see truth. God, open my ears. I really want to hear your word. I need your spirit, Lord, speaking to my heart. God, open up my heart. Open up my mind. Open up who I am. God, all I want is truth. I want to follow Jesus. I want his word. Is that your prayer tonight? Open my eyes that I can see. I just want to follow Christ and his word. Listen, as Mary Lou and Jennifer come to sing that beautiful song, bow your head and just make it your prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Lord, open my heart. Lord, open my ears. Lord, I only want Jesus. I just want to do what Jesus wants me to do. I just want to follow his word. Listen as the ladies sing. I love those words. Open my eyes that I may see. Visions of truth you have for me. Place in my hands that glorious key. That will unlock and set me free. Is that the desire of your heart tonight? Let's stand and sing it together. Let's sing together this prayer, this song, this praise to God all together, all over the country, thousands of voices singing together. Open my eyes that I may see.
my ears that I may hear. now I wait for thee. Jesus Christ and free in his word never deceived the weakest saint in the hands of Jesus Christ is free the weakest believer in the hands of Jesus Christ is liberated the most ignorant believer is wiser than the world's wisest men rooted and founded in God's word Oh, Jesus, thank you that you have set us free. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight that you haven't called us to be deceived by some cult. You haven't called us to follow some beast power. But through Christ and by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, we are set free. We're thankful, dear Lord, tonight that in your word and by your word and through your word and because of your word, we have a solid foundation and we're set free. We thank you that you've given us a mind to think and to reason, that nobody else has to make decisions for us in religious matters, that we can step out of the crowd, that we can follow Jesus, that we can be those believers that have our own personal experience with you, not compromising, not being forced or shaped into a mold. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Or Roy Rogers? Oh, yeah, I knew that I had a section here that was familiar. Now, now some of you are a little younger, you know. You don't know about the Long Ranger and Hyo Silver. You know, ask your grandma. She'll tell you about it. You know, granny will tell you that one. Now, in those old cowboy movies, how did you tell the good guys from the bad guys? You got it. You got it. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Bad guys always wear the black hats. The good guys always wore the white hats. You watch those old Long Ranger movies, Hyo Silver, you know. You watch Roy Rogers. You Roy, watch Hopalong Cassidy, those old cowboy ones. And the bad guys come riding up with their black hats on. And immediately you know, that guy's a bad guy, right? See, the guys come riding up in the white hat hats. And that guy's the good guy. Wouldn't it be so easy? If all false religious leaders just wore black hat and all the good guys wore white hats, say, ah, there's this one. <laughs> he's a bad guy. Ah, there's a good guy, you know. That would make it so much easier, wouldn't it? But it's not so simple today. Because sometimes you get confused with the bad guys and the good guys, and you're not quite sure who they are. But the Bible distinguishes between the genuine and the counterfeit. And I'm going to give you five ways tonight you can tell a cult from a genuine religious church, a genuine biblically-based church. I'm going to give you five ways in the Bible. Five ways you can distinguish between the true and false. Five ways you can distinguish between the genuine and the counterfeit. Now, the people that I'm concerned about most are the people who say, I will never get deceived. Those are the people I worry about the most. The people who say, look, I need this information because I know that there are going to be great deceptions in the future. Those are the people that are not going to be deceived. But the people that have a ho-hum attitude, oh my, you know, those poor other people, they're all going to be deceived. You know, it's the other people that are going to be deceived, you know. Reminds me of a story I heard once of how they sort oranges down in Florida. You know, they sort the oranges, A oranges, B oranges, and C oranges. So they go out and take all the oranges off the orange trees, put them in a great big dump truck. 
take the truck into a warehouse and put all these oranges on a conveyor belt. And all these oranges are on a conveyor belt, and they're going along. Now, imagine that oranges could talk, and one orange begins speaking to the other. And the one orange says, ha ha, this is fun. I'd rather be out on this conveyor belt than on that hot Florida sun. This is so much fun. And all the oranges are bouncing along. They come to a series of holes. The holes are small enough to let the grade C oranges through, but they are too small to allow the grade B oranges through. So the grade C oranges can fall through those holes just big enough for them. So all these oranges are on the conveyor belt and they're going along and they're having a great time. And the C's and the B's and the A's are all talking. This is fantastic. This is like Orange Disneyland. Then they go up to the C holes and all the C oranges fall through. Boom, boom, boom. And pretty soon they're going to be orange juice. The A's and B's go along. They say, that was too bad. Those C's went through. They're going to be orange juice. They go around another corner, and there are holes big enough for the B's to go through, but not big enough, but too small for the A's to go through. So they sort the B oranges. Boom, 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 they go, and all the A's are so proud, you know. Hey, those B's are going to be orange juice. We're going to the end on the roller coaster of Orange Disneyland, but they come around the corner, and there are holes big enough for the A's to go through, and they are going to be orange juice, too. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm concerned about people who say, I'm on this ride all the way to the end, and I'm never going to fall. It's just like Peter, who, th who said, Lord, though all men forsake you, not me, Lord. I mean, I'm committed. I'm going through to the end. And the Lord looked at him, and he said, before the rooster cries three times, you'll deny me three times. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if, you, if we are not clear in our mind how to identify a cult, right tonight, there can be a certain mind conditioning that's going on in your mind that you don't even know. And that mind conditioning is going on, and you don't even know it. And you might be in a Christian church, but the devil is so smart, and he is so subtle, and he's so ingenious that he's working in your mind in ways you don't even know. And he's preparing you to accept the mark of the beast. He's preparing you to accept the Antichrist. And you're not even aware of what's going on because he's so subtle. Tonight, I'd like to share with you how you can be aware of what's going on how you can identify a cult, and how you can be sure your mind never gets caught in a cult trap. Because before you ever go out and follow the beast power at the time of the end, your mind has gone down that direction, so it's easy for your feet to follow in years from now where your mind, in, the, in a two-year period, there was a 73% increase in New Age books. The New Age is exploding. You go to any bookstore today, and you'll see whole sections on the New Age. People are turning from the God of the Bible to the God within themselves, the so-called God within themselves. People today are looking for some magic incantation. They're wearing crystals around their neck. They're burning incense. They're looking for love and warmth, looking for some age of Aquarius. They're looking for a personal channeler that can channel them to an astral plane outside their bodies. They're trying to have some supernatural experience where the soul leaves the body and goes into spiritual ecstasy. And many people are going down a dead-end road and ending up in cults. Forbes magazine put it this way, astounding figures. Forbes magazine reported close to $2 billion per spiritual and physical well-being. Two billion dollars spent on spiritual aids. Spirituality is exploding in our society. Men and women recognize that they just can't face the stresses of 20th century society and 21st century society alone. So they're looking, they're searching, and unfortunately, they are running directly into cults. Unfortunately, the areas that they're running to are often very, very deceptive. Often, the areas that they're running to are like these. There are between 3,000 and 5,000 new religious movements in the United States. Three to 5,000 new religious movements. Many of them are cults. New religious movements are springing up like mushrooms in the South on a spring day after a rain. You know, it used to be easy to identify who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. 
I'll date myself. Have any of you watched long ago The Long Ranger or Hopalong Cassidy? Five. These were not fanatical people. They, some were young and some were middle-aged and some were old. Most were very highly educated. They supported themselves by their computer businesses on the web page. So these were not some intellectual crackpots. Highly educated, sophisticated, computer literate. They had ample amounts of cash. They had bought this mansion. Why is it that they followed one Marshall Applewhite and his co-leader? Why did they follow them? What reason did they do that? Why did they follow them to a mass suicide of death? One thing is for certain. Cults are absolutely exploding. Many people, young and old, are tired of churches that have little power. They're tired of churches where they go each weekend, each Sunday, and find spiritual nothingness. They're spiritually hungry. They long for something more. They long for something spiritual. They long for love. And they go into many churches, and they're so cold you could skate down the center aisle. So these people are looking for love. They're looking for warmth. They're looking for true fellowship, like in the New Testament. They're looking for something that stands for something. So many churches today don't stand for anything. So many churches today are afraid to say anything about drinking because they may lose half their members. They don't want to say anything about tobacco because they lose another half. They don't want to say anything about premarital sex. They'll lose too many young people. They don't want to say anything about extramarital affairs. They'll say some lose other people. So, so many churches today have watered down the gospel message that many honest-hearted people stop going. And they say, look, why should I go to church? I'm no better off that I, if I go or not. And so they don't find love. They don't find warmth. They don't find a Bible foundation. And so they begin searching. They begin looking. And unfortunately, many of them are looking in all the wrong places. My topic tonight is Revelation Unmasks the Cult Deception. It was a 911 call on a fairly typical Wednesday afternoon in Rancho Santa Fe, California, that tipped off the police. The anonymous caller on the other end of the line said, you may want to check out the welfare of the residents at a certain address. When the squad car got there, it was a very upscale neighborhood, a palatial estate on three acres of land overlooking the Pacific Ocean with nine bedrooms. What they found made national headlines and national news. Newsweek said, follow me inside the Heaven's Gate mass suicide. When the police rolled up to that mansion in Rancho Santa Fe that March day of 1997, this is what they found. 39 bodies, all dressed in black, black sweatsuits on, jogging suits, black Nike sneakers. They all had the same buzz cuts, at first, the police thought that they were all men. They discovered later that 21 of them were women. Everyone had a passport, birth certificate, and driver's license on their bodies. They all had a duffel bag placed at the foot of their bed with their personal artifacts in them. And then there was a little note about how the mixture for the vodka and phenobarbital that they took was supposed to be chemically mixed. And on the bottom of the note, it said, drink it all down, relax, and rest. Who were these people of the Heaven's Gate cult? Were they some wild-eyed fanatics? Who were they? There was a teacher respected in her community. There was a postal worker of a number of many years. There was a housewife and mother of 